9 and homework number 10. Uh, I've asked the TAs to expedite the grading so you guys can get that feedback before exam number 3. So this should be done either by this evening or Thursday evening, and they will be placed in a folder outside my office door if you wish to collect them. Uh, I will send out an email as soon as I know that they are there, so you guys can go and collect them as soon as possible. All right, uh, item number two, I will likely be opening an extra set of office hours this weekend as well, as I generally do before exams. And so if you guys have any lingering questions uh, about any feedback from homework 9 and 10 or just anything at all, that you can pop over uh, this weekend for extra set of office hours. I also have a set of office hours uh, this late afternoon, early evening as well. Nice. Of course, we have exam number three in class on Monday. And uh, the last topic we're going to cover before that is trees. Right, trees are also a very important uh, mathematical structure. They are indeed a type of graph. They are a specific type of graph, a specific constrained graph that is encountered quite a bit uh, in computer science and in mathematics. And so we will give it its own time. So thus, we will begin our discussion of trees. And so. A tree is simply a graph right, that is connected, undirect, undirected, and has no cycles. So graph. Then it is connected, undirected, and has no cycles. Right, an equivalent statement to this, an equivalent definition of a tree, is simply that a tree is a graph with one simple path, one unique simple path between any two nodes. simple path between any two nodes, or meaning that is a, a, a simple graph right, with no cycles. Right, that is also connected, though you can traverse from any node to any other node. And we'll just see a few quick examples of graphs. By using our same illustration, again, this is a, a type of a graph, so we'll use the same illustration we have been using for graphs as far. This is an example of a graph. <coughs> Make that this graph <clears throat> is connected, it is undirected, and there is one unique simple path between any two nodes. Right? We say simple path because technically speaking, there's an infinite number of paths between any two nodes. You can always just backtrack along the same edge a countable number of times. You can go from C to A, and then A to C, and then C to A, and then A to C, and then C to A. And then C to A. So we'll say simple path. It has one unique simple path between any two nodes. All right, another example of a tree. I'm not going to name these nodes. Again, here you can see that this graph is connected. It is undirected and there are no cycles, right? meaning that we have a graph with one unique simple path between any two nodes. Now, given these examples, we can identify a fact here. Right? A tree with n nodes has n minus one edges. We can see this. If we add an edge to any one of these graphs, we would end up with a cycle, given the definition. And therefore, we would not have a graph. All 
All right, any questions? Pretty straightforward so far? Okay. All right, far left on the bottom. So fact, a tree with n nodes has n minus one edges. Right. A tree that is encountered quite often is a uh, type of tree, right? That's encountered quite often is a rooted tree. Right? A rooted tree and it's simply a tree where one of the nodes has been designated as the root. Right. We'll just do a quick example to motivate this. <coughs> and often when you see a tree diagram, it may be in this fashion here. Right. We call it a rooted tree if one of the nodes has been designated as the root. Here we'll designate this node as the root. And generally speaking, if you see a tree drawn in this fashion where one is clearly at the top and the rest sort of branch out right, in sequence down from this, Right. It is understood that this node at the top of this diagram is the root node, if indeed we're talking about a rooted tree. And here we'll explicitly denote this as the root. Right. A good example of, right, of a rooted tree would be a file hierarchy. Right. In fact, in Unix systems, the base Right, the base file, right, the starting file in a file hierarchy is called the root directory. It is the root, it is the top of the tree, it is the base of our tree. Right. From there you may branch off and you may have folders, maybe one for program files if you're in a Windows system or you know, documents, images, favorites, things of that sort. Generally speaking you have a tree or a hierarchy. Right. Nowadays it's common to put links in some of these folders that might link back to other folders. And so. You know, maybe technically it's it's really more a graph than a tree, but in, in its purest sense, a file hierarchy is a tree. Right? You have a, a path from uh, from the root down to any of your subdirectories without there being a cycle. All right, so let's talk about, we have quite a bit of nomenclature to cover when it comes to trees. So to talk about trees, we have to learn some of the, the jargon associated with trees. So we'll go ahead and, and do that now. Right, we'll go ahead and have an example tree here that we can use. All right. All right, given that we've designated, again by default, if you see a tree drawn in this fashion where one is clearly above right, the rest and they're sort of down in levels or in depths, right, this one is designated as the root. Right, it's important to note that these edges, although we've defined a tree to have undirected edges, these edges in a sense have two possible directions, right? sort of unspoken. Right, the edges can either be seen as going away from the root or going towards the root. Right? So to make the discussion of trees right, um, a, little bit, a little bit more clear, right, we'll generally say that these edges will, will be directed away from the root. Right? Though again, there's they are considered undirected. Right. Given this, we will define parent and child nodes. Right. And assume nodes P and C are adjacent on a graph. Right, where the incident edge it goes from P to C. And again, here these edges technically don't have direction. We'll just simply say the edge right, goes from. P to C away from the root. Okay. Right, 
make then P is the parent of C. And C is the child of P. All right, so in our particular example here, right, we would say that B is the child of A. Right, A is the parent of B. Right, C is a child is the child of A. Right, D is the child of C. E is the child of C. And C is the parent of D and E. Right. Note that our root has no parent. Similarly, we can introduce the idea of a sibling. Sibling nodes share the same parent. Yeah, question. No. Sibling nodes share the same parent. Right, for example, D and E are siblings. Siblings? Sibling, yeah. Sibling nodes share the same parent. And so, for example, D and E are siblings. B and C are siblings. And any questions about parents, children, or siblings? All right. We can also define ancestor and descendant nodes as follows. An ancestor of a node n right, are all nodes that lie on the path from n to the root. I should say simple path. Again, indicating that we're not going to backtrack. Right, and we'll also add not including n. n is not its own ancestor. So in this particular example here, right, A is the ancestor of B. Right. If we're looking at node D, both B and A are the ancestors of D. Right. Are the nodes that lie on the simple path from D to the node. Right. Essentially, anything higher up on the tree on the way to the root node directly. And on that one unique path to the root node. That is an ancestor, right? A descendant, right? And, and in the other way is, right? Are all the nodes located, right, at the subtree headed by a particular node? And so, descendants of a node n. Include. All nodes in 
in the subtree. Who did that end? And so for example, and all of the descendants are B of B, right, are all of the nodes sort of below tree, below B, excuse me, on this hierarchy. So if we were to create a subtree rooted at our B node here, right, sever the connection with the parent, right, the remaining tree is considered the subtree. And all of the nodes contained here, except for B, are descendants of B. So D, E, F, and G are descendants of B. All right, and lastly, we have a tree. We define the root of this tree. Root being designated. Note that this is, in a sense, it kind of looks like a tree that's been inverted. And right? we have sort of the trunk, the root of our tree is here at the top. Right? These nodes here at the bottom, the nodes that have no children, are called the leaves of the tree. So a leaf node. Right, there's a node on a tree with no children. And a node with no children. Right, and so those are many of the that's a lot of the jargon nomenclature used when discussing trees, when referring to the nodes on a tree. All right now we'll talk about a few other types of trees, particularly rooted trees that are used quite a bit right, in computer science, and a few more attributes of trees. And then we'll discuss some fun examples and uses of trees, right, other than file hierarchy. And so an in array tree, right here, in is an integer, in array, in array tree, right, is a tree. Right, that is rooted, where every node has no more than m children. One very popular MRE tree is a binary tree. Which is simply just a two array tree. And that's a two. And meaning that every node in this tree has no more than two children. A few examples of these. We can do and this is a three area tree. as each node has no more than three children.
And here is a binary tree or a two array tree. Again, each node has no more than two children. All right, so let's look at a few examples of where we can use trees. All right, so trees are graphs. So just as with graphs, we can use trees to represent. Right, they can be used as data structures. They can be used to organize and or arrange mathematical structures. And they can also be used to organize and arrange procedures or processes. And one common use for a binary tree is a binary search tree. We will informally introduce this idea via example. Right. So the idea behind using a tree as a data structure, right, such as in the case of a binary search tree, right, uh, can be viewed as follows. Right, let's say that we want to store a whole bunch of data right, into some sort of structure. Let's say we'll just use numbers or integers for a simple example. Right, if you were to store them in an array, right, if you wanted to search that array for a particular piece of data, for a particular um, bit of number, how long or a particular number, how long would it take in the worst case to search the list list of size n? We take about right about n steps, right? We'd have big O of n search of that list. Right? However, if we organize or sort and keep our data ordered into a structure such as a tree, right, we can improve upon the search time. And so let's take a binary tree here, for example. Where we'll add an extra caveat on how we insert items into this tree. Right? With our example of an array, we are just randomly inserting values into the array. And thus, to search the array to find the particular item we're looking for, it would take, in the worst case, 10 steps. Here, let's say that we have, we put values in here accordingly. And that is, let's insert items into this tree as follows. All right, first, let's refer to these nodes. Let's give them names. Uh, in a binary tree, since we have two nodes, they're, they're generally given names just because there's two of them. We know that there's going to be, at most, two of them. Right? We have the two children, which we have a left child and a right child. And of course, this is going to be two for all two area trees. And we'll use this nomenclature because it'll help us to describe how we're using this binary search tree. And so this child here right, is considered the left child, and then this 20 is considered the right child of 10, and left and right child. All right, so this particular tree, note that every single node in this tree, right, its value, except for the root, right, is the left child is less than and its parent's node, and the right child is greater than its parent's node. And this is true for each node in the tree, right? and except for the roots. Okay. So if we were to search this particular structure, right, let's say we would start at the root, and let's say that we wanted to search for the number, let's say, 13. How could we proceed by searching? Right, well, if we start at our root, we see that the value here is 10. And since we know that we've inserted these items such that all the right children are greater than the value of the parent node, and all of the left children have values that are less than the value located at the parent node, then we know that if 13 is in this particular tree structure, it has to be along the right path. Similarly, once we go from the 10 node and we sort of come down here to this particular node, 20 node, we know that if 13 is in this list, if 13 is in this list, it has to be along the path down the left child. And so we follow down the left child. If we hit a leaf node, there's two possibilities. Either we found the item we're looking for, or the item is not in the list, given these rules. Right, in fact, we do find 13 here. 
Right? And note, you did not have to traverse every single node, even in the worst case. So no matter what number we're looking for here, right, how many comparisons are we going to have to make in the worst case in this particular tree node, right, given the scheme that we just right, that we just um, right, that we just discussed? In the worst case, yeah, yeah. Here we started at ten, right? We proceeded down to twenty. We proceeded down to thirteen, right? If we're searching for any number, right, we're always going to start at the root node and proceed on a path down to one of the leaf nodes. All right, so here we've reduced e, right, the number of comparisons from seven. It would have been in the worst case right, if we just use an array right, to three. All right, in general here. What is actually going on? Note here, when we made this decision to branch right at our root node, we eliminated essentially half of our list. So that's half of the list. We don't have to waste our time searching because we know the item's not there. Right? Again, when we made our next decision here, we halved the amount of the tree. Right? We halved the number of nodes again. Right? In fact, during, at each comparison, at each successive comparison, each decision we make, since we have a binary tree, we're either going to branch left or right. We are eliminating an entire branch, in a sense, having the remaining subtree to search at that time. Right? So each iteration or each decision, we're halving the number of nodes that we have to search. Right? This is the opposite of doubling the number of nodes we could search. Right? So halving is an inverse of the exponential operation. So the number of operations we would carry out, right? in the worst case, in a binary search tree that is balanced, would be log base 2 of n rather than big O of n, which is a huge reduction. Again, because we're having, after each decision we make, right, this mathematically is log base 2. Right? We get to eliminate half of the tree during each decision, or at each decision, we have log base 2. Let's see another good example of the use of trees. Again, we'll just introduce some of these fun uses and concepts informally. How many of you have heard of decision trees before? Decision trees. I get they pop up quite a bit in uh, processes. Like you might use decision trees to code up an algorithm, right? To use decision trees to make you know, a decision or a series of division uh, decisions. A fun example of a decision tree is a game tree. Right. Right, a game tree is a particular type of decision tree where you map out a series of decisions you might make, right, or one might make when playing a game. Right, so the root node in such a tree might be you know, the beginning point of the game. Right, for the, make this very simple, we'll use tic-tac-toe to get example. Right. There's only so many decisions you can make in tic-tac-toe. We start off here at the root, indicating you know, a starting point to our game. And then each branch would indicate a possible decision we could make in this particular game. Right, so one decision would be, let's say that the first player is the player who has x. Right, this branch could indicate the decision that the player puts the x in that first spot. Right? This next decision, or this next branch, might indicate right, the situation where the player places the x in this spot, right. and so on and so forth. Maybe this last one is the player places the decision here in the last spot. Okay. Next, right, we can have decisions right, after these decisions might be made. Right. So after, for example, this decision is made and we're at this state of the game, Right, we can anticipate what the opponent might do, what player zero might do. Right? Then there's a set of possible decisions as well from this point. Right? For example, the player may place the zero in the second spot here. Right? Or they may place it in the third spot. Right? Or somewhere else. All right, and Similarly, you could continue to fill out this tree. It would become very large very quickly, right, with all the possible decisions that the player or their opponent might make at each step of the decision-making process. Again, you can see making a move as making a decision. So this decision tree is here 
mapping out, illustrating, organizing the sequence of decisions, right, what player and their opponent might make during the course of the game. So this is used quite a bit whenever you want to automate a decision-making process. Right, there have been some fun instances of this in history. How many of you have heard of Deep Blue before? Okay. And so Deep Blue, very famous chess playing algorithm, I think by IBM. IBM uh, designs maybe 20 or possibly more now years ago. Right, so who beat the grandmaster of the day, right, the, the reigning champion right, in, a, in a set of games. And Deep Blue, right, organized the game space, the sequence of decisions using a tree, right, a fairly complex tree, but a tree nonetheless of this sort. Right? And so what Deep Blue would do is essentially list out all of the possible, or at least all of the practical moves that it could make at that particular stage of the game, right, and then anticipate what the opponent would possibly do, sort of at the next stage or the next level of the tree, right, and continue to search down the tree and identify which decision now which lead to, would lead to a good state in the future, right? Which decision now would lead to more better states that could, uh, in the potential future, right? And so Deep Blue was a good example of this. I believe Deep Blue used a search algorithm that was a little bit of a depth first and a breadth first search, meaning that it would search down the tree to some degree. As you can imagine, tic-tac-toe, pretty simple game. There's only so many decisions to make. Chess, there's a lot more decisions to make. There's a lot of different moves, a lot of different pieces, right? This tree gets very large very quickly in chess. It's impossible even for a very fast computer algorithm to search all possible decisions to make and see all the way to the future, to the end of the game, right? all the way down to that loop node where the game ends and there's no more decisions to make. Right? So what Deep Blue would do is do a, uh, a limited depth first search, meaning it would look into the future maybe three or four moves or five or six moves. And in particular, Deep Blue, I think, went down to about seven or so based on the situation and other calculations. And so it would look about seven moves into the future to determine what move it should make now. Another really fun and recent example, you know, I don't know the name. This, uh, I think, a, an article just came out in Science, right, for Google's version of a Go player, right? Is this, what, what is the algorithm saying? AlphaGo. AlphaGo? Yeah. Right, AlphaGo, all right. And AlphaGo, another fun example, right? So Go, right, after you know, computer scientists conquered the game of chess, right, everyone thought that, you know, computers would take over the world, they're going to become smarter than us, and right? they can beat, you know, the, the best chess players in the world, right? But then people identified, well, although chess had a really complex structure, a lot of possible moves, the state space huge to search over, Go has even more states. Go is even more complex from a state-space scenario. So many thought that although we were able to conquer the chess game, that there would be no way we could design a computer algorithm that would beat you know, the expert or the master Go players. However, just recently, uh, this, right, this theory has um, been shown to be false, as Google's AlphaGo algorithm to play the Go game has recently beat, I believe, one of the best or the best player right, uh, on the planet. And so two good examples of Two fun examples of using decision trees, game trees. Right? Uh, and again, this tree structure, this graph structure is great for organizing searches, organizing mathematical structures, right? organizing data as well. All right, so in order to take full advantage of this tree structure, it is important to know how to traverse the tree structure. But I mentioned the idea of depth first search and breadth first search. So we'll look at depth first search right now. And again, we'll introduce these concepts informally, but then we'll look at the pseudocode. And we'll do depth first search. Right, very informally, a depth first search, most searching algorithms uh, for trees or commercial algorithms will, of course, start at the root. Right, a depth first search, when given the option, we'll try to go deeper into the tree. We'll always try to go towards a leaf node whenever given the chance. Right, so whenever it hits a dead end, whether it, can, it can't go down any further, it'll simply just back up and then try to go down again if it can. And right, informally, right, again, by, deep, by standard, depth first searches will usually start you know, illustratively with the leftmost child and then proceed with 
uh, onward in the right direction. Right, so we would start at the root and go to this left child. Right? Here we're given choices here, but we always want to go down. We won't go back up. Always go down depth first, favor depth. Here we can't go down any further. Right? So we end up backtracking and then try to go down again. We can go down again. So we go down. Again, we go down. All right, we can't go down any further. Backtrack. Still can't go down, so we backtrack again. Can't go down any further here. We've already gone down all of those paths. And so then we go back up and then go down. Down, down. How can we get this done in pseudocode? Pretty easily. Note that this behavior is not unlike a procedure we've seen before. In fact, we have seen a characteristic or a behavior like this when we had non-tail recursion. And in fact, we can design a depth first search algorithm using non-tail recursion very quickly and intuitively. Oops. Here we'll do a depth first search for a binary tree with one argument, a node. And again, we'll assume that each node has a left child and a right child potentially. Right? There might be null values, there might not be. Right? If n is not null, well, then we simply do the depth first search of left child of n and then do the depth first search of the right child of n. Which here we do in fact have non-tail recursion. We are going to execute, we are going to invoke right, this function. Right, uh, this should be We'll just call it D, we'll just call it uh, DFS. Sorry about that. I wasn't able to cram the B in there. But this is uh, for binary trees, right? We're assuming that there's just at most two children here. Right. We are in fact invoking this body or this function inside of its own body two times. So we're going to get this non-tail recursive nature, which will easily and very intuitively allow us to traverse this binary tree, which has two branches right, at each node. And so again, when we first call this node on the root, or call this function on the root, the first thing we'll do is enter here and call the same function on the left child. And we'll keep doing that. When we enter the scope again, we'll call that function on the left child. And we'll keep doing that. And right, as soon as we try to traverse past the, the left node on the left child, we will break out of this if, right? And then we will recurse. Right, return, right, which will be synonymous with backtracking to this node, and then we will proceed to going down the right file. I encourage you guys to trace out an example with, with this pseudocode here and see that it will, in fact, traverse this tree or any example tree that is a binary tree right, in a depth first fashion. There are three very common variations of depth first searches, right? three variations on how one might visit or perform calculations on a node. And so we'll rewrite it here. There is a pre-order traversal, in-order traversal, and post-order traversal. And there are questions in the practice, the exam practice problem set all right, that I encourage you to, <laughs> to review with respect to pre-order, in-order, and post-order traversals. Let's discuss the, the difference between these are, are as follows. Again, we'll assume we have a binary tree. Yep. First. Again, we'll make sure that n is not null. And then we have, right, we would go down to the left child. Right. And if you were to 
perform a calculation on in, such as a print or, or something of this nature. At this point, right, it would be pre-order. Right? If you were going to do the computation of this node in here, in between going down the left path and the right path, it's an in order. And, and if you were to visit a node or print it out, for example, right, after performing these recursive calls, right, it would be called a post order for this one. All right, and so that is the difference between pre order, in order, and post order. Right, uh, you have a homework example where print statements are placed in, in essentially these, not homework, but uh, practice problems, where print statements are placed in each of these different locations, and you're asked to trace out you know, how the print statements uh, would occur given a, an input tree. So I encourage you guys to, to practice those examples and learn a little bit more about in order, pre order, and post order traditionals. All right, so that is all right, that I want to discuss about trees. Again, I encourage you to uh, do some examples with depth first search and identify the difference between pre, in, and post order traversals. Right. A good way to, to see if you understand it is to try those three problems in a practice set. If you need. One, one more note I'd like to make unless there's any questions about tree traversals. Mix. I think uh, a few of you caught an error in the last lecture with, uh, with uh, the Euler paths. And so I just want to rectify that so there's no confusion. The Euler paths. And the Euler circuits. And So there is an Euler circuit. Right, there exists an Euler circuit on a graph. and only if every node has an even degree. I believe I said Euler path when I, when I mentioned this last time. Right, the constraint is different if you have a path. If you don't have to end on the starting node in the path. If it's a circuit, every node has to have an even degree. Right, if you have a path, meaning you can end your traversal, your path doesn't necessarily end where it began, right? then there can be no more than two nodes with odd degree. But again, this is for both of them are for uh, connected, uh, connected graphs. I, I think we I think we're touching it. Both of you. All right, now we'll do a quick review for exam number three. If you guys have any questions about any of the topics as I go through them, now is a good time. The general structure and setup of the exam will be the same as exam number two. So there will probably be about five different sections and you'll be able to skip one of them. And the, the coverage will go back to our discussion of counting. And 
of course, we'll need to know the basics of counting, including the product rule, right? Partitioning of a complex process into subprocesses. Well, another counting basics, such as the inclusion exclusion principle. Of course, we'll need to know combinations permutations. Right, as I noted uh, earlier, I believe, I don't expect you to perform these, the actual evaluation of some of these expressions. So, um, you can use, leave your answers in choose form right, or permute form, like the C and P functions, right, or exponential form, or in factorial form. Right? This is fun. Right? I don't expect you to do all that multiplying out. However, you should know the equations for each of them, the choose function and the permute function, not for the purposes of evaluation, but uh, you, should, you should simply know them. They're simply a result of the product rule and, the, and any of our other basic counting principles. And so you should certainly understand those equations and really just be able to derive them if necessary, as they are just a result of the product rule and the counting scenario. We also covered uh, the pigeonhole principle. Right. And then when it came to combinations and permutations, there are a number of key characteristics associated with the problem that would really change the counting schemes. Right, so just be aware of them and know what to do in each of the different scenarios, right? If there is or is not repetition. Right, if there are distinguishable or undistinguishable objects. Right, and if order matters or not. And identifying these key factors in any counting scenario will certainly change your approach, your method for, for counting. And also remember, right, in some scenarios, some counting problems, it really helps to simplify a complex problem sometimes by trying to transform or change the problem, look at it from a different perspective. <coughs> so I encourage you to, to practice some problems where that was the case. All right, next we discussed finite probability. Right. Very important, the basics of probability, right? Understanding and being able to identify, define the sample space of a problem. Right. And the events associated with the problem. Right. If you can get that far in a problem, you're, you're likely going to do well. Most errors, most mistakes right, in probability problems or trying to uh, analyze a probabilistic scenario come with you know, inappropriately identifying the sample space and or the event space. And so make sure that you feel comfortable identifying sample spaces and events. And understand the idea of a trial or experiment. Right, and then some of the basic theorems. Or probability distributions. Right, we discussed the idea of the law of total probability, or right, the probability of an event plus the probability of not that event is equal to one. Either the event's gonna happen or it's not gonna happen. Right? So we also discussed the additivity of probability measures. That is, you can calculate the probability of an event by adding up the probability of all of the outcomes of that event. And we also discussed conditional probabilities. Right, 
believe in the idea of independent events. It's important that you understand these concepts and, and know the associated equations. Again, if you understand the concept of a conditional probability, like that a particular, what's the probability of an, of an event given that another event has occurred, right, the, the equation just makes sense. You can derive the equation. Right? Uh, similar with independent, what does it mean for two events to be independent? This means that the probability of both events occurring is simply equal to the product of each of the individual events, right? the product of the probability of each of the individual events. And we also discuss it's with probability Bernoulli trials. And binomial trials. And the meta binomial trial is simply a sequence of Bernoulli trials. Or a set of Bernoulli trials. And we also discussed random variables. Right, expected values, which we can take, right, since a random variable will map the set of outcomes to a measurable space to quantitative values, we can then take expected values of those quantitative values. Right, and then lastly, we discuss generally not these phase theorem. Right, and how we can update probabilistic estimates based on evidence. And again, you should know Bayes' theorem. <coughs> and I think that wraps up. Probability. Oh, lastly, we've covered graphs and trees. With respect to that, uh, graphs and trees, so I know the basics, the basic definitions. Like the basic nomenclature. And a lot of, a lot of our initial discussion here of graphs and trees was just picking up some of the nomenclature, a lot of the terms, a lot of the jargon associated with each of these structures. <coughs> and there are also a couple types of each of these structures that uh, that were pretty important, such as simple graphs. What's a simple graph? What's a weighted graph? And so, no, I know these terms. That's what they mean? What is a weight? And what is and what is a weighted graph versus a not weighted graph. We also discussed uh, paths on graphs, and in particular, we talked about three paths. Yeah. Are you, uh, I'm not sure this. And we talked about Euler, Hamilton, and shortest paths. Right? I'm. I will not ask you to come up with pseudocode for algorithms to find these sorts of paths, but it may be the case that I will give you pseudocode to, to find a particular path, and then, and then you might be asked to trace out the pseudocode and then and, and, and determine what the output of the procedure would be, something along those lines, maybe. Right? Or I uh, may introduce a problem scenario, right? say, you know, Let's say that we have a traveling salesperson and they want to visit each of these cities. What type of path would be a solution to this problem? Something like that, something along those lines. Um, but I will not ask you to come up with the pseudocode to create a Hamilton path or, or something like this. Uh, another thing that I might do is if I gave you a path, uh, an algorithm or pseudocode to traverse a graph or to perform some operation on a graph, I may ask you what the time complexity of that algorithm might be in terms of n, where n would be the number of nodes in the graph, or e, where e would be the number of edges in the graph. Right. 
Uh, you should be able to determine this either by tracing out the code and or thinking conceptually about the problem, like how many computations, how many comparisons would you have to make? Like are you traversing each edge a constant number of times? Are you tra traversing each node a constant number of times? Uh, and we also discussed trees here. And right, again, the basic, the definition, the nomenclature. No, like a pair node, what's a child node, what are siblings, and what is a binary tree. Thanks. And then also know the difference, uh, or at least understand uh, depth first search and in order, pre order, and post order. Again, I won't ask you to derive the pseudocode for the exam, but if I were to give you the pseudocode for an in order traversal, or give you the pseudocode for a pre order traversal, uh, and in a particular input graph, I might ask you what's the output of a pre order traversal for this particular graph. Very similar to one of the uh, example questions you have on your problem set, for example. I think that's it with respect to coverage. Right? Those are the, the main four topics. And again, they'll probably have about five sections, and we'll be able to pass to skip over one. And any, any questions about the flow or design coverage? Yeah. Designing an algorithm from scratch? Oh, subsets. Right. Yeah. So uh, you should you should at the very least be able to do that. Like uh, list out a, a subset. Right. I, it is possible then right, that I might have a question about designing an algorithm for counting purposes. That. Right. Yeah. I I won't ask you to design an algorithm to traverse a tree or a graph. You guys will get plenty of that in data structures when you get to data structures. All right. We are out of time.